and welcome to Bad Boy Cinema. I'm your host, Rick Reel, and today we're going to talk about a movie that um, is one of my favorites. It's a five-star and a like on Letterboxd for me, and it's a movie that I think is unfairly maligned by some. I know certainly some in the audience don't think this movie is particularly good, and there's some people who I think really like this movie, probably not in this audience, of course, but people who really like this film. And uh, I would say don't really get it or they're not liking it for the right reasons. Uh, one might even say they're watching it wrong, um, which, you know, is, is an opinion I have uh, about many, many types of media, people consuming it wrong. And people look at me like I'm an asshole for saying that, but I, I think it's possible. Um, but anyway, we're talking about Inception, the 2010 film directed uh, by Chris N. Um, and it's it stars a close personal friend <laughs> to the show, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, of course. Um, but I'm going to just do a very brief recap before I just kind of do sort of like my own analysis on everything because, uh, you know, I think we need to again, establish what's going on, especially for some of you who have not seen the movie in a while. Hopefully I can, you know, jog the memory of folks. Um, but basically, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is a, is a thief, but he steals, uh, ideas and stuff from people and secrets from people in their dreams, uh, using dream sharing technology, which is not really super elaborated on. And that's not important. And he is partnered up with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and they take on a job. And the job ends up being a test uh, for uh, Ken Watanabe's character um, to, you know, he's going to hire them for his own job, which is to uh, break up a energy conglomerate uh, that will be inherited by Killian Murphy's character. And then, you know, it, it turns into a heist movie. They, they gather a team. They do the heist which involves going through several layers of dreams in Killian Murphy's mind. And uh, then that's they do the heist, and that's it. Inception is, at its core, a heist movie. Um, you know, we're doing a real quick, real quick recap because uh, the plot of this movie really doesn't matter, and people really get hung up on the plot details, I think, of this film more than so many that I've I've seen, especially Chris N. films, but people at the time really praised this movie for the complexity of the plot, right? Um, it kind of opens as... Uh, mm, it, op it opens in a confusing way, right? The movie opens... Uh, well, it opens with uh, Leo washing up on a shore and talking to very ancient Ken Watanabe, and then it cuts immediately to a different time period where... Leo is talking to normal age Ken Watanabe, right? Um, and, you know, it's confusing that the opening of the movie establishes kind of how the dream within a dream stuff works, kind of the uh, mechanics of the movie, um, for those of you who are largely confused about what's going on. And I've seen this movie, I mean, easily a dozen times. And so I am very familiar with how it's structured. But I remember seeing it in the theaters when it came out in 2010. And, you know, it's like you're kind of confused about what's going on, or at least I was confused about what's going on. And then by the end of the opening segment where they kind of are explaining the mechanics, and I think they explain it without being too wordy in the beginning and kind of, you know, they go through the mechanics. They explain it pretty much as succinctly as possible without with it still being possible to follow along. Um I think they do a pretty good job. And they also establish some kind of emotional beats that they'll continually tap back through throughout the movie uh, with Leo's character. Um, and I think it's all well done. And then, you know, from there, it kind of establishes the larger goal of the movie, right? Leo's character can't see his kids because of something, right? Something being, of course, that his wife died and, uh, you know, they think that he did it, you know. Um, which of course he did not, he is innocent, but <clears throat> the movie doesn't explicitly tell you that in the beginning, but it's just, Leo's on the run. He can't see his kids. He wants to see his kids. And Ken Watanabe says, Hey, I'm going to offer you a job. 
you'll see your kids if you can do it. And that's kind of the, you know, kind of getting the stakes established, why he's going to even do this job, you know, whatever, why the movie is existing in the first place. And the job, of course, is to, instead of stealing a secret from somebody's mind, to insert an idea in somebody's mind. And, of course, it's established that that's very difficult to do. Uh, of course, Leo says in the movie, of course, that he, well, he knows that it is possible. And, of course, we learn at the end of the movie that he knows it because he's done it before to his wife, who is dead, because he did that, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And pointing out these details, right, like, oh, spoiler alert, by the way, I mean, it's from 2010, so if you haven't seen Inception, honestly, I don't even think, like, spoilers are important, like, I think it's a more interesting movie to watch a second time, and again, not for necessarily the reason some people might pick out for Inception, so... Put a pin in that, right? Put a pin in that kind of conversation piece. Because there's a lot, again, there's a lot to talk about. But there's... I, I want to nail down the movie first, which is admittedly kind of hard to talk about with the dreams and all that with also still being succinct. You know, I keep picking movies to do by myself where then I have to, like, explain <laughs> plot, uh, which is annoying. Oh, I have... Oh just flung a pen across the room, but I have my notes. Let me rip off the, uh, there we go. There we go. Some, some, uh, some Foley for you folks. Um, well, I don't know why I took notes cause I just, I know this movie like the back of my damn hand. Um, they, well, let's look at this. The budget was 160 million and it made 839 million, which is pretty, pretty good. This movie, went crazy um but we'll maybe get to why um oh it won four oscars for like really random shit but uh it's it's a great it's a great film um 2010 yeah inception great film um right so the movie sets it up that it's it's a heist film right it, it is a heist movie and so the middle chunk of the movie is dedicated to spelling out the plan and also reestablishing what the mechanics of everything are in case you didn't pick up on what's going on in the beginning, which, based on reactions to this movie, a lot of people didn't, you know? <laughs> and so I think a lot of people, because they didn't understand the movie going through it and then when they're able to rewatch it, they're able to literally just understand the mechanics of the plot they go, oh, wow, this is a smart movie. And that's not true, like, for that reason, right? It's, that's not why this movie is smart, uh, because you couldn't figure out the plot of the movie. And it's why some people who are media literate watch the movie and they go, oh, like, I understood the movie just fine. And people are talking about how great the plot is, and uh, I understood it the first time, so those people are stupid. And also the movie is bad. And I don't think that's really true either, or at least I don't think it's fair. So I'm going to try and <laughs> I'm trying to defend the movie as best as I can without just being like a fanboy about it. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've been a huge defender of Chris N on the pod before. Um, and I, I like to defend Chris N where it's due. And, and I think his movies have heart to them, or at least, you know, most, I don't think Tenet does, but I think, you know, I think the, the ones we talked about on, bad boy cinema have heart in it. And I think Inception is an, an exception to that either. It, it's heart is the most important piece of the movie. And the heart I think is easier to understand. And I think is more affecting on the second watch when you know what every, there's so many lines of throwaway dialogue that just kind of mean nothing and just kind of wash over you on the first watch, but on the rewatch, you just pick up these little pieces and it's not like plot mechanic. Oh, this is so smart. It's like, Oh, like Leo's character is like one inch away from killing himself the entire movie and is completely out of his mind, you know, like that. And, and it's in a sad way, right? It's, this isn't like shutter Island where, you know, Leo's uh, sad and out of his mind, but like the plot twist is that he's out of his mind. You know what I mean? Like, there isn't a plot twist that he's kind of not mentally all well in the movie, but whatever. Um, in the opening sequence, Leo's deceased wife 
uh, is is like haunting him in the dream and causing problems, and that she kind of recurringly appears more and more frequently throughout the different dreams. Um, and so, you know, I think it's easy to forget that the character of his ex-wife in every scene we see in one of the dreams is just a, a piece of Leo's character, right? His ex-wife is just a, a fragment of his own mind because she's, she's dead. She doesn't exist and she's not in the dream literally. And I think knowing that fact, even cause on the first watch, you're like, yeah, she's not there really, but like, she's not, you don't really understand the depth of which Leo's character is like, mentally ill you're not you're not mentally ill but just very tormented um and it's it's all done honestly i think in a, in a show don't tell kind of way i think the, the 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 telling of the movie which maybe is a little overdone right is in the plot mechanics and stuff and sometimes the dialogue is a little on the nose and you know it's kind of there to just sort of keep keep the wheels on the the train on the car i don't i don't do trains have wheels like i know they have the tracks and there's wheels that are on the tracks and the train moves but are they, are those called wheels there's trains in this movie by the way and train i don't know it, it, the movie does also feel like a, con, a conglomerate of stuff that chris n likes and i think that's great um, you know what i mean like if a guy's just like i'm gonna make a movie about shit i think's cool and put it out and it's like an original idea um pretty neat you know like Fun stuff. Anyway, so Leo gets his team together, um, which, again, in the middle of the movie, of a heist movie, I think once once it's established what's going to happen, and then the heist part, and that part's exciting, the, that middle second act kind of uh, sort of sucks, and I think that is kind of an inherent issue with a heist film, and I don't want to really linger on it too much. I'll acknowledge it's it's definitely the weaker part of the movie is that like middle you know, hour-ish uh, is, is kind of weak. But I think what Inception does well uh, with that middle hour is how, it, it again, it's it's planting seeds of these emotional beats. And so when I'm talking about emotional beats, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about filmmaking, right? And part of what I think makes Inception interesting as a film, and this, again, is not particularly an insightful read on the movie. This isn't anything new. And I don't think the movie is smart individually for this movie being about filmmaking, right? But the movie, right, like, as I just said, is about filmmaking. The heist that they're doing involving the dreams is based on, you know, finding these emotional beats. The dreams kind of happen, you know, with, with cutting from scene to scene, and that's just how the dream logic works. And it kind of is mirroring maybe a reflection in the pond more than a, a reflection in a bathroom mirror, right? But it's mirroring... Uh, you know, filmmaking uh, in, a, in a broad stroke sort of way. And again, that's interesting. And when you think about the movie from that perspective, you get kind of a different sort of read on it. And I think what makes this movie interesting to me over something like Tenet, which I think is also about filmmaking, um, it's about like action filmmaking and kind of the absurdity of it. That's, that's Tenet. Whereas I feel like Inception is just about storytelling, right? Really more than filmmaking i mean it's it's about storytelling through the medium of film but it's not about movies you know what i'm saying you know is that is that a distinction without a difference i don't know but it's uh i think it's an important one to make and it's my podcast and i can do whatever i want uh no and no one is here to stop me um <laughs> so there's that um but look it, also, doing these solo podcasts, man, it's, it's difficult because I have to basically talk nonstop for like 40 minutes and uh, I'm tired. I have a liquid IV. I just ate like a bunch of ice cream to get through the end of the movie. Uh, not because it's a bad movie, but, you know, you've seen it a million times. And honestly, it still it still gets me. I still tear up a little bit at the end, uh, you know, not and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Again, I think <laughs> members of, of my fan base will... Uh, make fun of me and bully me in, in our discord server but uh you know that's fine I, it's it's all in good fun and uh you know i think my taste in movies aren't for everyone but i think this is a movie that again 
is uh, both unfairly praised and unfairly hated for the same reason. And I, I want to try and unpack other reasons why this movie is at least compelling. Uh, but again, Tenet is, I think, also about filmmaking. And I think it's a movie about filmmaking, specifically about how action movies and like stupid, dumb action movies, because I think that's the only way to really reconcile <clears throat> anything about the movie, right? Like, otherwise it is a just a stupid movie for spectacle's sake. And I don't think Chris... And, and I don't know what my voice is doing right now. I apologize. But I don't think Chris N. would just make a dumb movie just to make a dumb movie. I think he is at least a thoughtful enough guy. I'm not going to say smart. I'm going to say he's a thoughtful guy. And, uh, you know, I think he, he would make something that he would want to be interesting beyond just the time mechanics of Tenet. Maybe we'll do a Tenet episode, but I don't really want to. I don't like Tenet very much. Um, but, it, it you know, I think it is this sort of meta commentary on action movies and kind of how vapid they are in some ways and with inception and also with tenet nothing else is going on right it is it is you know maybe maybe if charitable read it's about action movies in a meta narrative kind of commentary sort of way and then also it's about the time mechanic stuff and just watching that spectacle which is admittedly kind of neat right that's all really tenet has going for it right inception it it's a heist movie it is a movie about storytelling it's like a character driven sort of like drama in pieces, right? There's some action sequences that are pretty fun. Like there's a lot of different stuff that goes into Inception that makes it an interesting movie. Like even the plot mechanics themselves are interesting to think about and it's structured in a way that asks slightly more of the audience. And I think just because of that, people praise the movie because it's like, oh, it requires a little bit like, not a lot. I'm not saying it's a complicated movie. I'm not saying people are smart for getting Inception or, like, oh, it's... I, I don't think it's so smart that people need to watch it twice. I think you, if you're paying attention, you can watch it once, and just a lot of people are not particularly bright. And I don't think Chris N. is a genius for making Inception, right? But I think it, it has a lot of things going for it, uh, and it does all of those things pretty well. Does it do any of them the best? Probably not, right? Like, there's even Chris N. movies where, you know, there's emotional beats that are maybe a little bit more poignant, or at least, you know, there's there's some more thoughtful stuff there. I mean, you can look at Oppenheimer. Um, arguably, you can look at The Prestige, uh, you know, and, and The Prestige is another example of a movie with, like, kind of mechanics to the storytelling that are interesting and that you know that the ending of the prestige i think is pretty impactful or at least from a watching the film and going oh whoa that's crazy and then it puts the whole movie in perspective you know and i think inception doesn't do that quite as well as that but it does a lot of things i think very well and i think it results in a very kind of dense film with a lot to kind of revisit uh not to say that a movie needs to be revisited all the time, but I think you can really kind of, you just see it. There's it's, I never get bored of watching it. I hate rewatching stuff, but I really like rewatching, uh, inception, you know, every, every year or two, I think it's, it's a good watch. It goes on pretty quickly. And I think there's, there's always something to pay attention to. Again, there's a lot of throwaway lines that, uh, just sort of add an additional kind of wrinkle of texture to, Leo's character and kind of just the, 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 the story, the kind of emotional moments, uh, you know, again, there's, there's a lot to like, uh, but you know, again, the middle part of the movie is a little over explainy of stuff. If you've already understood it and you know, maybe there's an edit where they kind of cut that stuff down, but as it is also a heist movie, that is kind of a trope of the genre right where they have the part where they explain the heist and then everything goes wrong during the you know the uh third act where it plays out right and uh you know with oceans 11 they don't dwell too much on that middle arc but hey that middle part still sucks right and they still have these weird tangents that uh cause things to go wrong that happen in the second arc where it, or the second act Whereas in Inception, they just start explaining stuff and putting down breadcrumbs for these emotional beats. And then things just go completely to shit in Act 3. And a lot of the stuff going completely to shit is largely Leo's character's fault for just kind of uh, being 
stuck in the past, being full of you know grief and regret, and he, and he's mourning his wife, and you know he's he's very desperate. He wants to go back to his kids, and you know those emotions that are he's he's largely not really opening up about. Is kind of the problem because then this dream you know persona of his, his his deceased wife just kind of ruins everything, and he's so like out of touch with reality that he you know he hesitates in key moments and he gets kind of lost in it and uh you know it's all very sad it's it's um another critique i've heard about inception which is this is kind of unrelated but it came to mind um and you guys are just kind of along for the ride on just my sort of adhd uh train right it's a train of thought so to speak uh is that, you know, people also critique the movie that, like, the, the dream sequences are boring and, like, not very interesting. And it's like, oh, you're telling me, like, this, you know, a, your your cool idea of a dream is, like, rain falling at a weird angle. And I think that is uh, a bad faith argument. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know about the rest of you. Like, some of my dreams are fantastical, yes. But a lot of my dreams, at least for me, probably for Chris, and if I had to guess, is, like, you just exist in these either past memories or like these um you know you are dreaming you're in a place and it's kind of familiar but like there's stuff about it that doesn't really make any sense and you're running into people that don't really make any sense and people are just acting a little off and a little weird um and you are going from place to place without really knowing how you're getting there and yeah like i do think that's kind of how dreams work you know at least for me on most times you know obviously if i'm like lucid dreaming and i want to be riding a dragon or something you know i can do that but for the most part my dreams are like i'm being haunted by people in my past and i just you know kind of uh, want to kill myself <laughs> and so in many ways i am leo in this movie uh, and that's part of why i like it and so i'm not unbiased by any means but you know uh it, it hit it hit a certain nail on the head for me uh in 2010 and in 2014 you know i i relate to him even more uh <laughs> And yeah, um, not that I've had quite so many moments where I, I'm unable to discern reality from, from dreams, but I've had some, I, I haven't not had those and, uh, it's fine. Um, but I do, again, I think it's unfair that people are critiquing like the quality of the dreams. It's like, dude, a lot of dreams are like pretty mundane and they just sort of, you know, like just weird shit kind of happens, you know? Or, and again, the movie is also acting as a vehicle to talk about storytelling in, in film. And so it has to still kind of be tied to the language of film. Um, and there's still some cool practical effects and sequences in the movie. And so I think that's great. You know, there's <laughs> a lot done that I think is uh, pretty, pretty good. Um, I mean, I just, you know, I don't know how there, there's so many things in the movie that just, he barely used any computer effects at all. And, and the movie still looks great. Like it really holds up, um, you know, an era where CGI was kind of bad. Right. I mean, well, I don't know. That's not even true. Cause like Iron Man was like what, 2008 Iron Man still looks pretty good. Um, but like, you know, I mean, it's like, there's this weird thing where it's like they, traded practical effects for special effects and uh, the special effects look more dated faster. Uh, it looks, I mean, again, the movie <laughs> holds up great visually. Um, nothing seems too goofy or weird, really. Like, with the exception of when they're in the dream in France and uh, Leah's talking to Elliot Page um, and, and Elliot Page realizes it's a dream. Um, you know, like fruit and, and stuff on the street just starts exploding. And that looks a little bad, uh, for, by today's standards, but visually the rest of the film is, uh, you know, it, it holds up great. It's, it's fun. It's a good looking movie. Um, I think it's well, it's well shot in many places. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice looking film. It's a slick picture, you know, it's a good flick. I think a flick is a good description for this movie because this is not high art i'm not i'm not defending this uh as, as something really particularly meaningful or impactful but i think for what it is which is again like a heist movie there's a lot of layers to it that you can 
a lot of layers of dreams. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of layers to the movie that I think make it, again, it's interesting. And it's interesting on a rewatch, not because it's complicated, but because there's just, it's a dense picture. And uh, it's still a fun flick. And like the action sequences are fun and like the way that the plot is structured because it's so uh, bouncing around from level of level to dreams, uh, you know, and it, it keeps it keeps you engaged even if you don't want to be. Like when I was rewatching this movie, uh, like, you know, two hours ago before I started recording, I was like really wanted to get some work done on my computer. And I was like, well, I, I picked Inception because I was like, I can do Inception because I don't need to pay attention to it that closely. And I can do work and like I can play games on my phone and I can kind of just, you know, goof off. And uh, the thing is with Inception is that it's just it it I got locked in. I, it's fun to watch. It's a fun film, um, and it still it makes you feel stuff. And so to get to the the other part of the kind of emotional beats, right? Because I talked about Leo and you know his his character's kind of grief and guilt and that kind of really replicating. Like again, if you've been haunted in your dreams by things that you are feel, feel guilt or grief for um it's a very accurate representation of that right but another thing that the movie does is, is more with the sort of filmmaking storytelling angle is with killian murphy's character who uh plays the inheritor of the you know energy conglomerate company that you know uh, Ken Watanabe wants to have broken up so that there isn't a monopoly uh, because he's very pro-consumer. <laughs> he's very woke, very 2010, like anti-monopolistic practice. Uh, it's very, it's very funny. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why, but it, it's, that's how it is. Um, You know, uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted with my computer because it's just so fun to click around and, and look at things while I'm supposed to be doing something else. Like talking to you lovely folks. Um, I hope I hope you're all well. I know that we've been doing solo episodes for a minute and we probably will continue to keep doing them for a while. Um, and that's fine. And I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, we might have some guests in the future. I'm trying to work some stuff out. So logistically, uh, which is... <laughs> a challenge when you know you've got other stuff going on but uh you know thank you for sticking with me specifically i really appreciate it i like talking about movies i like doing the podcast i want to keep doing it and as long as you 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 folks keep listening i'll keep talking by myself or with friends but you know probably by myself most of the time and uh you know if if things change and we go back to the old format that's great and if they stay like this that's also great you know just not gonna not gonna touch on it too much but uh yeah i just wanted to say thank you i i do appreciate i do appreciate every one of you listening um yeah so thanks not to be too sappy but uh it's this is fun i like doing it um and i like having excuses to talk about things that i like and uh or have hot takes on or whatever you know it's a it's a good venue to just sort of get shit out there you know you just got shit to say right um but back to killian murphy's character right so the goal of the film for our plucky band of heroes uh slash thieves even though they're not stealing anything they're putting something where it ought not to be <laughs> i guess well uh, you know, so Killian Murphy's character, the part of the heist prep process is also like planning kind of like the mental manipulation they're going to subject to his character. And that mental manipulation is kind of like also the emotional beats of a film. So they kind of have this like nonsense, like three act structure within the third act for Killian Murphy's character where he's learning stuff about his father that isn't true they're making up all this stuff but they're making like a compelling emotional narrative for him to like think he's having in his own dream to make him act a certain way in real life and it's uh <laughs> you know it you know, killing murphy's character expresses that you know his the last words his father ever said to him were uh you know that he's he's disappointed and, you know, there's this obvious kind of, like, friction between the dad, who kind of probably thinks his, his kid kind of just sucks, you know? Uh, like, you know, he's, he's, he's mid, as, as the youth would say. 
and uh, <laughs> you know he, he thinks his kid sucks and uh, the goal of you know Leo and his team is to have some kind of catharsis with the father and I don't know if any of you have fathers uh, I'm sure well, I don't know but if you've ever had a difficult relationship with your father uh, the emotional beats at the end of this movie where you know in in the third layer of, of the dream heist uh, you know Killian Murphy meets with his his dying father and his die he you know his dying father almost spits out the disappointed thing again and Killian Murphy's like yeah I know yeah I know you're disappointed in me dad like I get it and uh, you know he's like I'm di- I know you're disappointed I couldn't be like you and then the dad's like oh no I'm, I'm disappointed that you tried and then you know Killian Murphy opens up a safe to reveal like kind of like a MacGuffin that sort of has that emotional resonance to him and as the audience you you get that as well and uh it's an emotional it's like it's an emotional moment especially if you've had this like kind of difficult you know tried relationship with your own father it, like it gets to you and it's also like kind of twisted because it's all built on absolute bullshit you know what i mean like leo is completely pulling the wool over <laughs> this guy's eyes and but it like it works and like that's such a weird it's a weird feeling to be like you, you it's like triumphant but also like you're like oh this poor idiot you know it's it, it's it's surprisingly complicated it's a surprisingly complicated feeling and i think more complicated than the stuff going on with leo's character and i think you know again it's something you're more i think you can get lost in the emotion of, of that moment of that catharsis to forget that it's like a completely constructed idea and it's not based on anything um and it's it's i don't know it's 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 interesting it's it's got a little zest to it you know um and then of course you know Leo having to confront his guilt with his uh, deceased wife is also, uh, it's, it's challenging having to let go of, you know, something that again, when he, he's talking to that character, it's just a mother. It's a, it's another figment of his, of his own, you know, subconscious. And it's that powerful and that kind of lingering. And, uh, you know, I think we've all had conversations with, uh, you know, those people locked in our, in our, brains right that we uh you know you 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 reoccurringly run into them over and over again kind of rehash memories but they're like remixed in new ways and and those kinds of you know those conversations with his wife were kind of like you see the original memory at one point in the middle there's a flashback but then you see kind of these remixes and kind of like retoolings of the same conversation throughout the film in different pieces and I think that's also very accurate to filmmaking. Like I think, or not filmmaking, to uh, dreams. Uh, and I think, you know, again, just to defend the like the dreaminess of the movie, I think it's still accurate and fine. And if it wasn't accurate, like who cares? Like I think the emotional uh, connections there are more important. Um, but I guess to circle back to, uh, you know, my my thesis here on people praising the film and you know, denying the film its its merits kind of for the same reasons, right? I think a lot of people praise the movie because oh, the dreams are complicated, right? It's, oh, there's a dream within a dream within a dream. Whoa, that's really cool. And the movie kind of, I think, doesn't do itself any favors in sort of uh, kind of not hyping that up because it's, it's, it's not a very hype-based plot. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's methodical, and it's interesting, but hype is not really the, the word I would use to describe Inception. There's moments of tension, but not really moments of hype. Uh, but the movie does kind of like stress, oh, a dream within a dream within a dream. That's crazy. And I think that the mimetic quality of that sort of idea has sort of taken, you know, it's kind of run away from the film itself and what the film's trying to do. Uh, the trailers, I think, I think the trailer is pretty iconic for Inception. I actually recreated it. <laughs> shot for shot and line for line the trailer for inception for a spanish project in high school and i got a hundred on that by the way uh, if you if you want a link to that video just you know shoot me a dm on discord and i'll send it to you it's pretty it, i think it's pretty good my spanish is not very good uh but the the quality of the video i think is is uh it's it, for for something i did in high school i think it's pretty fun there's a there's a shot in there that i'm still kind of proud of um I mean, it's riffing off of stuff from the movie, so it's like, 
I'm not proud of the shot, but I'm proud of how I, I recreated the shot, I should say. Uh, I think that is neat. Um, but, you know, people get hung up on the on the dream structure and then they get hung up on the ending because in the ending it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the heist after, you know, much, much tribulation about, you know, a lot of things go wrong. The heist goes off without a hitch. Well, no, it goes off with several hitches. In fact, we reviewed one of the hitches on this podcast. Check out our hitch episode. Ha 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 ha. But <laughs> that, was, that was terrible. Uh, but, you know, it goes off. They, they, they do succeed. And, uh, you know, Leo gets back to his kids and he's home. And he's back in the States and he's not, you know, he's not being hunted down for not murdering his wife, right? Uh, and, you know, he spins his little top because in the movie you spin, your, you have your totems that help tell you if you're in a dream or not. And his is a top, you spin it. If it spins indefinitely, he's in a dream or at least in somebody else's dream because he's the only one who knows how the, the, the physics of that top work. Um, and, you know, at the end of the movie, the top's spinning and spinning and spinning. And uh, we don't know if it's, it's going to fall or not. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of discourse at the time of the movie releasing, I think a lot of the discourse that still lingers, not as much as when it released, but there's still some of it online, is like, oh, is, is he is still in a dream or is it real? And first of all, I think Chris Nall, Chris Ann, excuse me, has gone on record to say that, uh, you know, it's the scenes with Michael Caine in them are real, and Michael Caine's at the ending, so the ending's real. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I think it's more interesting to just say that, you know, that he doesn't care because he, he spins the top and then he walks away. He doesn't look to see if it falls or not. And the audience doesn't look, get to see if the, the top falls or not. And so I think it's it's more interesting to say, well, he doesn't care anymore. He's accepted this reality as his reality and it's over. Um, but I will say, you know, I think he would have accepted like... <laughs> Uh, if it was a dream, he would have probably had his wife still there and, you know, like she would have like popped up at the end and that would have been like ooh, kind of like a horror movie vibe, which his as an aside, uh, his his wife in the movie uh, kind of has like there's like kind of like a horror vibe to everything that she does, which is interesting because, again, anything that she does is really just his own subconscious doing it to himself Uh and I think the horror context of that, again, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, none of these pieces individually, I think, are like rocket science. But I think it, it's a movie that's a, a greater than the sum of its parts in many ways, or at least when you're viewing all of the things at once, it's easy to just lock in on one thing and only acknowledge that one thing that this movie's doing when it's actually up to a few different things. And it does those things all pretty at least adequately. Um, and again, I think that makes it a pretty good flick to watch and put on and enjoy. Um, but, you know, people get hung up on that ending or because it's ambiguous, which again, I don't think it's super ambiguous. I, you know, whatever. Uh, I think people who think the movie's really great because either they didn't understand it the first time and they needed a second time to understand it, or they think the ending is, is crazy because it's ambiguous there's some people who are really smart and they're like, Oh, well actually the ending is not ambiguous. Like what I just said. And you know, it's not hard to understand, but they ignore the emotional content. They ignore kind of the story making, uh, storytelling filmmaking perspective. They ignore that it's still technically like a traditional heist movie and structured that way fairly adequately. They ignore all these other pieces. They ignore the performances that I think are still on the whole pretty good. Um, they ignore it because they want to feel, and maybe, maybe many people in the audience might feel the same way, but they want to feel kind of smugly superior to people who they think are dumb. And they're not probably wrong to think those people are dumb, but I think they are, you know, not letting the movie be what it is and they're not seeing what it's genuinely up to. And I think it's, it's an earnest film. A lot of people, I think, give Chris N a lot of shit for trying to be like a guy who's huffing his own farts and think he's really smart. And like, you know, he, he thinks all these old, oh, these crazy, well, intricately constructed puzzle box movies are really, you know, peak cinema. And that's what he thinks. And he's an idiot for thinking that. And I think he just thinks things again. And I've talked about it, you know, in in the prestige in the Oppenheimer 
uh, episodes where he, he, I think he just likes certain things and he it uses film to explore those ideas. And he obviously clearly likes making movies and he loves film. And that's part of this movie too. I think he wanted to make a heist movie. So he's got a heist movie in here, you know, and I think he wanted to explore, explore dreams and explore kind of those sort of darker, negative haunting dreams that people have and kind of put a horror twist on that and like all these ideas together in one movie that's still pretty fun to watch i think that's cool and i don't think the movie's trying to be anything more than that i don't think it's trying to be smart i think he's just interested in those ideas and was able to thread that needle you know through all those ideas and i think that's neat um so i don't know i i don't want to like end and the episode here, but I think I have kind of talked about enough with Inception and kind of what makes it good. Uh, and I don't want to talk about it to the point where people maybe won't revisit the movie and maybe reconsider their, their hatred. Or maybe they'll watch it and they'll think I'm stupid and they're entitled to that opinion too. I don't really give a shit either way, but uh, it is one of my one of my favorite movies. Again, it's not maybe like the best movie ever. I'm not claiming it is, but I do like it a lot. I think it's up to some more than what people will think, not necessarily in an intellectual way, but in like a, in an earnest, just exploring ideas kind of way when, you know, again, is Ocean's Eleven a better heist movie? Yeah, probably. Is it up to anything else besides that? Not at all. You know, like there's no, you don't give a shit about George Clooney or Brad Pitt in that movie. You know what I mean? Like is Shutter Island got a better representation of, of Leo specifically, like, under mental duress and has a better twist involving, you know, the ending and kind of tying the way the movie ends to the character's mental health. And so when you rewatch it, you have a different perspective of Leo's mental health. Yeah. But the movie's not up to anything besides that, you know? And I think that's what makes inception interesting is that it's up to many things, not necessarily trying to be the best at any of those things, but it just is engaged with a lot of different ideas uh, and I think, you know, if you, if you open your heart to Inception, I think you can learn to appreciate that. And so, I don't know, I try, I'm trying to champion stuff that I like now that I'm doing this by myself. Uh, so I don't know with that, uh, thank you for listening. Um, again, hopefully in the future we'll have some, uh, some guests on, uh, if you're listening to this and you want to hop on the show you want you want to talk about a movie that you feel really passionately about that you really like i'd be happy to have you on i think that's a fun kind of positive environment i think talking about things you like is cool and you know i i love being a hater i'm a a real (laughs) real hating bitch uh but you know i think it's nice to talk about things that you like and uh and try and sing their praises and defend them when they maybe need defending uh, so, you know, if you're interested in doing that, just reach out to me in, in whatever way works for you. Uh, <laughs> but with that, again, thank you for listening. Uh, again, just want to say, you know, really, it's truly thank you for, for sticking with uh, the podcast as it's kind of in a state of flux. Um, but I will see you or you'll hear me uh, in the next one. So uh, thanks and goodbye.